it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. Hey, welcome to Branch Together. I'm Jenna, and today we are reading Revelation chapters 10 and 11. Over and over throughout the book of Revelation, we are going to see this theme that God is in charge. Um, The word almighty is going to be used quite a bit. And in Greek, this means the one who has his hand on everything. Revelation is not for the faint of heart. Its message is deeply disturbing a lot of the time. Um, And it causes us to evaluate our allegiances, our convictions, our lives. What do we live for? Or for who or what are we willing to die for? Okay, so this is a good day for us to talk some more about how we interpret Revelation. Um, I'm sure you've, you've heard someone who they said, oh, I've watched the news and I think this person in our political world or this leader uh, is connected to someone or something um, symbolized in Revelation. I'd be hesitant to believe those interpretations because I don't think they really line up Uh, with what Revelation is saying. So the people who who kind of go along with these theories, they find something in Revelation and they find something in a modern occurrence and they try to put them, connect them together. And I don't think that's uh, something we should do. And and here's why. So a historistic, whatever, historist, um, these historist theory people um, predict that the different ages in the church development um are kind of like happening in the judgment in Revelation. So the developments are happening uh, over time. Um, here's what the thing, though, is people who believe this are thinking that that they are living in those end times, right? That we must be living in the last days or the nearly last days. And so then they retrofit all of history to fit into Revelation, Um, if that makes sense. So whether it was people who believed this in medieval Europe or modern day America, Revelation then has to be stretched out to differing lengths to make it fit the theory. Um, And it's kind of incompatible with the book's intent. It's not how the original audience would have viewed it. Um, We need to read Revelation uh, as a communication intended primarily for the people at the time it was written, first and foremost, and then go from there. So That might be a little confusing, but you don't need to read Revelation looking for current events to prove that we're in the end times or to describe a political figure. Um, But the readers of this book, the original audience, found this book deeply meaningful for their lives and for their own situations, so much so that they made sure that they wrote it down, passed it down, and it's in our our Bibles today. Um, So something you want to think about as we're as we're reading uh, these next few chapters that will get a bit more confusing with imagery. Um, is what did the original readers, these churches in Asia Minor, what did they find so powerful in this book um, that that led them to hold it so tightly to themselves that they would want to make sure we kept reading this um, and believe that it was God's word. So let's pray. And today um, I'm going to read a prayer uh, that's kind of out of scripture. So pray with me. You, O Lord, bestow favor and honor no good thing do you withhold from those who walk, whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Amen. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face was like the sun, his legs were like pillars of fire, and he held a little scroll opened in his hand. He put his right foot on the sea, his left on the land, And he called out with a loud voice like a roaring lion. When he cried out, the seven thunders raised their voices. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders said, and do not write it down. Then the angel that I had seen, standing on the sea and on the land, raised his right hand to heaven. He swore by the one who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it. There will no longer be a delay, but in the days when the seventh angel will blow his trumpet, then the mystery of God will be completed, as he announced to his servants the prophets. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. 
So I went to the angel and I asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take and eat it. It will be bitter in your stomach, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I ate it, my stomach became bitter. And they said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Then I was given a measuring reed, like a rod, with these words, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar, and count those who worship there. But exclude the courtyard outside the temple. Don't measure it, because it is given to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for forty-two months. I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy for one thousand two hundred and sixty days, dressed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. They have authority to close up the sky so that it does not rain during the days of their prophecy. They also have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague whenever they want. When they finish their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war on them, conquer them, and kill them. Their dead bodies will lie in the main street of the great city, which figuratively is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. And some of the peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will view their bodies for three and a half days and not permit their bodies to be put into a tomb. Those who live on the earth will gloat over them and celebrate and send gifts to one another because these two prophets had tormented those who lived on the earth. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet. Great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. They went up to heaven in a cloud. While their enemies watched them, at that moment a violent earthquake took place. A tenth of the city fell, and 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. The survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Take note, the third woe is coming soon. The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The twenty-four elders who were seated before God on their thrones fell face down and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, Lord God, the Almighty, who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, but your wrath has come. The time has come for the dead to be judged and to give the reward to your servants and prophets, to the saints, and to those who fear your name, both small and great. And the time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder, an earthquake, and severe hail. So, the angel, right, standing on the sea and on the land. He's showing his size and power. And again, letting us know that God is powerful over everything. God is in charge. The angel tells John to take the scroll. It's not handed to him. He asks the angel for the scroll, but the angel still says, take it. Um, God's word is never forced on anyone. I think that's a simple tidbit to take away, and we have to take it. And eating this scroll, God's word, it's weird, right? We eat paper um, or parchment, but eating uh, this scroll, God's word, would have reminded the readers um, of the prophet Ezekiel when God tells him to eat the scroll. Uh, And in both cases, we see that the word of God has to get inside of us. Um, At first, it's sweet. Like it says in Psalms, your word is sweeter than honey. And yet, it is bitter. God's word is sweet and, and good for us. But to have to be the bearer of bad news, to proclaim impending doom, that would be a bitter reality for, for John to have to swallow. Um, so let's consider next uh, these two witnesses. So plenty of speculation here. and People want to figure out who these two witnesses are. Some people today claim to be the witnesses. Um, 
if we were supposed to know who they were exactly, we'd have their names. But since we don't, scholars' best guess is that uh, these two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. The reasons we can guess it's Moses and Elijah are the following. Okay, so they have power over the waters to turn them to blood and strike the earth with plagues. Moses did this in the book of Exodus. They also have the power to prevent rain and to call down fire, which Elijah did in 1st and 2nd Kings. So, and these guys are bringing a somber message since they are wearing sackcloth, a uh, symbol of mourning. And they're going to be protected for the amount of time that they need to testify. And then they will be killed, left out to rot and be mocked. But they will be raised up to life and taken up into heaven after three and a half days, um, a short time compared to the thousand of days that they were preaching. Uh, the, the death of these two witnesses caused those who survived to turn in their terror and they gave glory to God in heaven. The seventh angel blew his trumpet and the loud voices in heaven say, the kingdom of the world has become the king, the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. God is in charge. You know, there's an awful lot of chaos today. Uh, sometimes it's kind of hard to believe that God has this all in his hands and he has it all in control, but this book of the Bible, Revelation, can remind us of what's true, that God is almighty, he is faithful, and he does have it all in his hands. Then the temple of God was opened, and the Ark of the Covenant appeared. So the Ark of the Covenant is a symbol of God's faithfulness and a reminder of God's special covenant with his people. And this would be very uplifting for them to hear this. So, I think we're always called to respond to God's word, and here's what I think uh, today, how we can respond. Uh, you have to take God's word, God's message, down into your very life and being. Um, it's a great thing to be chosen as a messenger of God. It's sweet, right? It says, how beautiful are the feet of those um, who spread the good news. Um, but not everything in God's word is easy to swallow. Life is hard. The reality of sin and the world around us is hard. And God does speak of judgment and punishment in his word. God never promised life to be easy as we follow him. It, it doesn't say in the Bible that God owes it to us to prevent our family or our friends from suffering in this life. It doesn't say that if we're suffering that God's not good. I mean, I'm sure most of you have a friend or two that they just can't wrap their mind around a God who would allow suffering. And so they walk away from him. But Jesus himself suffered the most horrible crucifixion and death for us. And if God wouldn't spare his only son from suffering, why do we think that we should be exempt? You might be the only one. You might be the one who has to say the hard thing to a friend about the truth of God and his kingdom. It might be a bitter thing to explain to someone the realities you're seeing. Maybe as you're reading this book, you're seeing uh, things in a new light. I think that's why it's so important to get God's word like into us, into our lives, to ingest it, to read it every day. Because we need to know God's character. We need to know the, all the facets of who he is, his love, his mercy, his faithfulness, his power, his almighty hand. And so that you might be able to trust him more and more in any situation. And so today I want to know, and I want you to leave it in the comments, how do you feast on God's word? What are the disciplines and reading plans that are helpful to you? So comment below and share the ways you eat your word. And we'll see you next time on Branch Together.